G'day from Australia, from Down Under. Oh, sorry, I was supposed to say G'day from Down Under. I missed that, but I'll say it now. I've said it now. I was really lifted up by Rob, Martin, Seth and Jason the other week. On one whole one day, I had four videos that were just really so uplifting. So thank you to all of you who are watching and hearing this. Thank you. That made my day so special. It made my day much better than normal. My normal day. Because it was just... Uh, just one, two, three, four, four really uplifting videos. So, yeah, awesome. Another thing is uh, I checked out um, what Jansen's channel is like and I really liked what he had to say. And, yeah, so go check Jansen out. If you haven't already, go check Jansen out. And he's been doing videos for, I can see that he's been doing videos for Nelly, well he's been doing it for two years, not Nelly two years, he's been doing it for two years. So another person to check out. We just need to keep encouraging each other more and keep uplifting each other. And Rob, you're very good at doing the encouraging and featuring people's channels. I think that's a wonderful thing that you're doing. And I want to say that I love this verse. For the rest, brethren mine, be invigorated in the Lord and in the might of his strength. Did I get that right? Did I get it exactly right? But you know, that's in Ephesians. I'm pretty sure it's the last chapter of Ephesians. I recorded a video earlier on in the day, which was the rest of God's grace on display. So here it is. God is now ready to be reconciled with all his creatures. The sacrifice of his dearly beloved son has so conciliated God that he cannot and will not ever again ask for any further offering. His righteousness demands that he accept as full and final payment the sacrifice made by the son of his love and as Christ is the firstborn of every creature, it follows that there is no being in the universe that is outside of the scope of God's conciliation. The only barrier to complete reconciliation is the stubbornness of creation. This is where the function of the ecclesia comes into God's purpose. We with sons of stubbornness, we ought to know what stubbornness means. We were once alienated from God through our being made to be partakers of sin's flesh. Yet because our God is rich in mercy, we are saved in and through his grace, that we might be used by him to display that same grace to others. Let us note, here note an advancement in terms. We are saved in grace. We are granted the forgiveness of offences in accord with the riches of his grace. We are to be used by him to display the transcendent riches of his grace. The value of grace is continually appreciating. There are no limits to his, its ultimate worth, for it is an expression of the love of God. Where sin increases, grace super exceeds. The principle was expressed in Romans. Grace is continually expanding till it embraces all. The transcendently transcendent burden of glory reserved for the Ecclesia lies in its being used to display in the eons to come these superlative riches of God's grace. And how do we display these? By letting the rest of creation see how God has been so magnificently kind to us in transforming us from what we were into what we are. Thus we are coming to see, are we not, that while as a collective whole, the Ecclesia was purposed from the beginning to be holy and flawless, and ever remains this in the sight of God, the complement of a sinless and flawless Christ. Yet individually its members are drawn from a sinful humanity in order that the full grace of God may be displayed 
and the Ecclesia be enabled to fulfill the role in God's purpose for which it was designed and to which it is specifically allotted. This may at first seem paradoxical, a combination of contrary conditions, yet it is in line with the dual aspect of the meaning of grace. Our place in Christ is for the loud of the glory of God's grace. Let it be noted that, long before any prospective member of the Ecclesia was made subject to the drawbacks of the flesh, the grace that was to rescue him from such was given to the Ecclesia as a whole in Christ. So that rescue from this body of flesh is not something that has had to be put in motion as a result of Adam's transgression. It is not an improvis improvisation to meet an unfortunate emergency but rather something that was purposely planned before even the eons began. These bodies of flesh are also termed bodies of our humiliation, Philippians 3.21, and again we note at the point that the ecclesia is not greater than its head. Christ first emptied himself to come in the likeness of humanity and then humbled himself to become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2, 7 and 8. We were born empty, like Job became naked into the world. Our humbling comes in the wearing of these fleshly bodies, prone to sin and decay and the ravages of death. They are constantly subjecting us to indignities, for they are continually warring against the spirit that is within us and are perpetually humiliating us. They are terrestrial tabernacle houses, temporary dwellings, in which we are groaning while awaiting transference to our permanent abodes, houses not made by hands, Ionian in the heavens. For we are awaiting a Saviour who will transfigure the bodies of our humiliation to conform them to the body of his glory. Then will the Ecclesia, whose realm is inherent in the heavens, be truly and in every aspect respect like the one who is its head. Love, grace and peace always from Oz.